the end of the duty day. They're not just at the point of contact, they're at the point of influence. To our sergeants and staff sergeants, you have an enormous responsibility to take care of America's sons and daughters who raise their right hand to serve. That's what This Is My Squad is all about. We're building on our foundation of strong, cohesive teams throughout the Army. We're starting with you, because trust in our Army starts with you. And no one knows more about this extremely important topic than Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Griffin. SMA, the net is yours. Well, I can say uh, welcome to AUSA. And this is this kind of live virtual event. Uh, and this is really exciting for me to be here hosting this event today. And I want to talk about our initiatives. I want to do a lot of things today. I actually, uh, before I even say all that, I just want to say thank you uh, to SMA Daily uh, for your uh, hosting this. And a special thanks to the Secretary of the Army. He's been a great supporter of the NGO and all the initiatives that we have for the NGO Corps and our Army in the last year and a half or year or plus since I've been in the Major of the Army. So the, the goal of what we're doing today is, you know, we're gonna do things virtually, but I also wanna be able to, to interact with everyone. So I, I remind you all, please go on the website and then post your question. Because at, at, uh, at the end, we are gonna go for questions. And I look forward to those really challenging questions that were, that were uh, troubling us right now. Um, so last year, as I started as the Star Major of the Army, we had our initiative. And what we wanted to do is say, here's where we're going uh, last year. So this year, as my second year, I want to say, here's where we, we are today, and this is where we're going into the future. So this is I check to see how we're doing and how I've done over the last year. The first thing we talked about last year was this is my time. This was about ownership, about possession. It was about a cohesive team and how we built that. And that's what we talked about. And then we built on that in this last year. What we said is we want to focus in on leadership in the middle. This is about fit discipline, and well-trained teams that have built cohesive teams. And as you build this, as we think about it, this is about understanding our people. We look at what we're doing with foundational days with Forces Command. This is about listening and understanding. This is about compassion. It's about empathy. It's about showing a positive energy for all our soldiers in the future. Next slide. This is, this is more than about a squad. This is the squad has to be uh, a, t a term of endearment. This is about not just an infantry squad, it's about everybody. It's about um, a small team. It's, you can be a member of more than one squad. You have your family, that's a squad. I, have my, I still say I have the greatest squad in the Army. It's uh, the Secretary of the Army, the Chief of Staff, and the Under, and the Vice. And those are the people in my squad. Um, but you have to have a strong faith in your squad leader, in your squad members. And the squad has to be the most influential thing that you do every day. But when we focus in on the positive things that we do as a squad, we believe when we focus in on fit, disciplined, well-trained teams as a cohesive team, we're going to drive down all the negatives that happen to us on a daily basis. It will drive down the sexual harassment, the sexual assault. It will drive down the suicide. It's going to drive down those issues we have with racial inclusion. We don't start with there. We start, start with the positive, and it's a positive outlook on life that eventually drives down those negatives that we have. But this is more than just a culture or a slogan or something that we're just saying. 
we actually have some tangible things that we're going to do with our army. One of those things that we're doing is this is my uh, squad app, it's the Tim's app. But I just want to be clear that with an app, it doesn't make us better as leaders, it just enables us as a leader. So we are going to have technology that makes us better as an organization. But remember, this is about a leader in the middle. But we're going to put something behind that. We're going to have a, a Tim's app. We're also going to have the Tim's leadership panel. With that panel, what we're going to do is we're going to have 24 staff sergeants that are going to advise me, the Sergeant Major Army, on initiatives that we can do better for our squad leaders in the future. We're going to have that kick off in November. But last year, we also talked about, I want to focus in on sergeants, staff sergeants, and sergeant first classes. And then I said, we're going to give stability to our folks. Um, and this is what we've done in the last year. I've said, I want 24 months as a staff sergeant, time in service, time in grade. And we're prioritizing that. This is what we've done. We said, we're going to move 1,000 NCOs from the, the the generating force into the operating force. And then over the course of the next year, we're going to put a thousand more NCOs back in our operational force. So we've got an army, an army strong NCO Corps, but we got to have the NCOs back in the squad. We've also worked on the NCO strategy. As we're looking at the NCO strategy, what we've done is we actually have the NCO strategy, what we had in the beginning was NCO 2020. And this year we revised that, we didn't put a date on it. Because this is gonna be our strategy for the future. It may develop over time, but we didn't need to have a date on it. The th first thing we had is we developed the lines of effort. We kind of revamped the lines of effort. Number one is leadership and communication for our NCO strategy. And when you look at, this is my squad, you can really see when we focus in on the leadership, it was really focusing in on the leadership. And the second piece of that is the communication. When you look at the communication, we think of how do we talk to our folks? Do we know our soldiers? We wanted to make sure that we have leadership right, and then we have to focus in on communication. The second line of effort, is operation and training management. When you look at this is my squad app, the first, the second thing in there that I asked them to focus in on was training management. How do we develop leaders that can have, be able to do training management? And we wanted to give them a tool to help them do that. The second line of effort is readiness and operational um, management. Correction, readiness and uh, program management. So what we're doing is with the program management is really how do you manage some of the programs that we have? We've got a lot of programs, but we have to have a ready force that can manage the th things that we do on a daily basis. And the last is the profession of arms. Our profession of arms is who we are. That's what we're all about. We're professionals. And when you heard, you know, General Bono talk about it, no one is more professional than I. This is our non-commissioned officer corps. So we have an NCO strategy. I encourage everybody to read through it uh, and look at those lines of effort because this is our strategy that's gonna take us into the future. The last thing that uh, we're gonna have in this effort is SMA talks. We do these, we've also done some noon reports with AUSA, but we're also doing a YouTube where we come in and we talk about those hard subjects and what we can do is just sit down, we have a good conversation. So I'd encourage you all to go ahead and tune into those. If you got those hard topics that you wanna hear us talk about, please send those requests in to us and then we'll bring those up. And we're out there, we're talking about those, but those are some of the initiatives that we have. And one of those things is SMA Talks. So now let's talk about training we talked about one of the lines of effort in the NCO strategy is training management. Uh, we've also looked at what we said. We wanted to focus in on sergeant's time training. We also wanted to do some kind of financial management training and a master's degree program. But some of the things that we really hit on this year uh, was the, the individual training. We really 
we really took off with the expert soldier badge, but we still have a long way to go. We got a lot of units that are doing it, but we have a whole bunch of units that aren't doing expert soldier badge. So I encourage you all to go out and schedule those events if you can. If you're a battalion, you can schedule an expert soldier badge at the battalion level. And I'd ask us all to go out and get with CIMT so that you can schedule your expert soldier badge. We want to master those fundamentals. The secretary and the chief are trying to give us time. It's up to us to use that time so that we build the foundation of all the individual tasks that we're doing so that we can get to the, the, the more difficult task. We can't get to the more difficult task if our foundation is broke. And we, that we have really put a lot of emphasis on that. The secretary and the chief has given us the time we need to take advantage of it. The second thing that we looked at as we went to the blended retirement system is we didn't have enough financial management training in our, uh, in our professional military education. So this year we put more financial management in our professional military education. We're gonna start with BLC. It was already in the uh, advanced individual training and AIT and basic training, but we really didn't have a progressive and sequential uh, financial training from basic leader course all the way to the Star Majors Academy. And this was really important, especially as we go through the blended retirement program. We have to have this. We have to be better with our financial management. If we look at some of the things we talked about in knowing our soldiers, and this is my squad, one of those things that really plague us is our financial literacy. Do we know how to prepare for retirement? Do we know how to prepare for those hard days? Do we have, you know, some way to do that? And our, that's why it's so important that we actually put financial, financial literacy training in our training in our professional military education. And last, we've got some of the PME professional military updates on education. And those are the things that we've done in the last year. Some of that is just because of, we, we acknowledge this is extraordinary time in our country. So we've actually, as we were going forward for our professional military education, uh, we had to change a little bit last year, but we are still moving forward. We have the order of merit list. We're revamping on how we put out those order of merit lists. We've also revamped this year. Every SAR major is going to get looked at every year. So there's no more, you know, once you make that rank, you're going to be looked at every year to make sure that we're staying qualified in, in our MLSs and prepare us. And those are the initiatives we, are, we had started a year ago, and those are coming to fruition this year. Next slide. Um, we also, last year, we said we want to align our NCO authority with what we're doing. And I can say this is where one of the big successes is we, we worked on this for years to make sure that our NCO authority is lined up. And we got the new AR 600-20 published this year. It's signed. It's out there. It gives the NCO authority to go ahead and take some action. It's about, and what it says is, you know, can you do, you know, simple things as doing some push-ups uh, when a soldier comes late for formation. So a soldier runs up. I said this last year. A soldier comes running up late for formation. Can an NCO tell him to do a few push-ups? So I want to be very clear. This is not about doing push-ups. This is about leaders and NCOs taking action. Their, your ability to actually do something, not pass it off to the commander, not pass it off to the first sergeant, not pass it off to somebody else. This is about NCOs seeing an issue and then taking some action. Sometimes that action is counseling. Sometimes that other thing, it may be something else. It may be corrective training. But in this case, the whole point of the correction on the 600 class 20 is not just to say, hey, I can have, you know, do some push ups. This is about your ability to do something when you see something wrong. Don't want to look over your shoulder and say, I, you know, I can't do this or I can't do it's about you having the small rep as a non-commissioned officer in our army to do something and take some action. And when you get those small reps, 
when we get to those bigger issues, you'll be comfortable. You'll be able to stop anything that happens because you have those small repetitions that you said, wait a minute, I can take some action. I don't have to wait for the commander because sometimes that might be too late. Uh, so this is all about an NCO being able to say, I'm going to take some ownership in my squad. I get those small repetitions where I have the ability to take action. And when I do that, it's going to be a better NCO. But we also, since we're talking about action, last year we said we're going to talk about, we have the Army Commitment to Overall Nutrition. We called it the Action Initiative. We talk, and when you think about this is my squad and what we talked about, we said, you know, fit. When you talk about fitness, uh, it's also about nutrition. So Army Commitment to Overall Nutrition is about the nutrition part of the fitness. And I think if we don't, if we can get the activity right, if we don't get the diet right, we're not going to be as fit as we need to be. And some of the things we've done, I'm really proud. It took us, you know, 245 years, but we finally now have a scanner and the DPAC. So when you go in, that long line should know they just went out like this week, is that you should be able to go into the DPAC and scan your ID card as you go in the defect, so they kind of helped you get through. Because a lot of people are saying, I can't get, I don't want to go to the defect. It takes too long. It takes me too long to get in the defect. So now you get a scanner. Uh, we've also got, we also have the ability, again, to pay with a credit card. Um, those haven't actually gone to the dining facilities yet. And this is how we're going to transition to the Warrior restaurant. But we haven't actually got those out. So we're working through of the surcharges and how that pay is going to look because you know some credit cards like the, the surcharge. But we've got the we've got the devices. Now we got to work through DFAS and everything on how we can go to the DFAC and pay for the credit card. So you have no excuse for your squad, depending on what that squad looks like, for you to go in the dining facility, soon to be called the Warrior Restaurant. We're going to save you time to scan your ID card. You can also go in there and just pay with your credit card, your new debit card. But we're also looking at how we can make the food better. They done the revamp the menu. And we also have one initiative. We got Robert Irvine. He's going to go up to JBLM. He's going to see how we can take the, the current product that we have and make a better product. In the we're going to do that at JBLM. I think we're going to try to do another one later on down the road, maybe at Fort Polk or NBC. So it's not just about access. It's not just about your payment method. It's about getting better quality of food in our dining facility so that we can be fit, disciplined, and well-trained team. And then someplace you'd be proud to eat with your spot. And speaking of proud of places to go, we're looking at our quality of life. Last year, we said, I said, here's the quality of life issue. What the chief of staff of the Army said, Here's my five quality of life issues. And this is where uh, we said we're going to focus. And I said I'm going to focus. Number one is the barracks. And I think I've been true to my, to my word. When I go to your camp posts and stations and your installations, even in this COVID environment, I'm still going to go out to the barracks. We're doing great things with our family housing. Um, we're going to put, we've already put more money. We're going to put more money into that talk about that more at the family forum. But we've also put about $9 billion in our barracks. Our goal is by 2030, we're not going to have any Q4 or Q3 uh, barracks in the United States Army. So we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're also going out to the barracks. And I'd ask for every leader and every soldier that's listening to this is that when we redo the barracks, you have to do your part to maintain the barracks. And I would use the analogy of it's like buying a car. I can buy a brand new car, but if I don't change the oil in the car, the engine will still blow up even though it's a new car. So we still have to go out and maintain our barracks. So we're going to put a lot of money in the barracks, we're going to get the new barracks, but I need everybody to maintain. I'm going to still go out and visit. One of the things I normally say is some 
Star Ranger. The Derek are old. I said, well, my house is old. I looked the other day. I looked and said, where do we live? And, you know, um, you know, I said, well, what's the first date that somebody occupied that area on the planet? It was 1957. So there's a big difference between an old house and a dirty house. So you can have an old house. We got to make sure that we keep a safe and clean environment for our soldiers, whether that's a brand new place or that's something built in 1957. I'd ask us all to show that our soul, show our soldiers that we care by just saying, "Hey, let's go check out where you live." If you're a nominative or a third major in the United States Army, it will, it is okay to walk through the barracks. It is okay. If something is not right, is demand, not just ask, demand that we fix it. Why are the lights out? Why is this door broken? Why is that? And then demand that somebody go fix it today. Why is the refrigerator? Why is the, the laundry, washer and dryer not working? Why do we, we wouldn't ask for our families in our house. If I was at home and my washer and dryer didn't work in my house, there would be no way to do my laundry. I would demand that someone come do that. We have to demand the same thing in our barracks. So we're still working on those quality life moves with the barracks, but we're also looking at uh, PTS moves. It's another on the on. It's not at the bottom, but it's also one of those five quality life initiatives that the chief talks about. And we've got, we made some great gains in our PCS moves. And now, it used to be when you did a personally procured move, which is better known as a city move, when you did that personally procured move, uh, that would be paid at, I believe, about 80 or 85%. The good news now, when you do it, we're going to actually pay you 100% of that move. We're also trying to get you so that when the weight of the vehicle is online in this day and age, you don't have to take the empty vehicle all the way to get it weighed. You can just look it up online. It's going to save you mileage to get to the weight. Then to drive all the way back to Philadelphia. You can always do that if you really, really, really want to. But you can use your weight ticket on the scale. It's on every vehicle. It's off the internet. And we're looking to do the weight tickets. Give you 100% of your personally procured move. We've also done some things um, in, uh, in the COVID environment to help us out with our PCS. We got more, we've uh, hired more inspectors, but to make sure that they come out. They don't, they shouldn't be coming out and just going, here's my card. They should actually have a checklist when the inspector comes out and say, okay, do they, are they wearing their PPE? Are they wearing uh, gloves? Do they do this? Do they do that? And then it's not just, hey, here's my card, call me if you need anything. So we've hired more inspectors to come out, and we've given them a checklist to make sure that our PCS go well. I know we're doing better. I believe we're doing better. But I asked you all, if we're not, fill out the surveys. Uh, sometimes you don't fill out the surveys, and we're not getting the PCS uh, move feedback that we need. So if, you, or if you're doing well or you're not doing well, I'd ask you to fill out the the survey at the end of the PCS move. Um, so, but we'll put out more on these quality initiatives at the family forum uh, with the secretary and the chief and I at the end of the week. So last year we talked about talent management. Uh, we had a lot of things that were going on um, in the beginning. And a lot of her uh, when I first came in was what are the officers doing? What are the officers doing? This is what they're doing. What are we gonna do for so here's what we're doing on NCO. We already had started the OMR. I kind of already talked about those initiatives with the order of merit list and how that's going to revamp. It's no longer done on time and service, time and grade. It's done by talent. And you're going to be reassessed every year. So you maintain that talent. And it's an OML. So if you're qualified, you'll get promoted. And then they're going to go down the list. If you're not fully qualified and you're number one, well, you're not going to get promoted. You got to be full qualified. That could be PME qualified. You got to do these things that you're ready. You've taken your distance learning. You've got your uh, education, and you're qualified. And you rank ordered from one to ten. And then, if you're qualified, you'll get promoted. And the next year, you're going to have to recompete. 
if you don't get promoted to the next rank. Um, so we've got the semi, semi, we also made some changes in the semi-centralized promotion board. We really wanted to look at how are we doing uh, with our promotion board. And one of those things we asked for is add more scenarios to that. We've also, we've asked for um, giving us uh, situational questions on our board. So this is going back to this is my squad at knowing our goals. You come in, you may say, hey, how did you do with the board? This is also about coming in and say, how many soldiers do you have? And so we put out some new board guidance on that. With the first sergeants, we're going to do the first sergeant talent management assessment. We're going to run a, a, a program on that in December. So they're going to come through. We're going to assess first sergeants. And we're not going to bring everybody in to one central location, but we're going to try it on the installation and do an assessment. We're also going to do the super maintenance assessment program, and we'll run a pilot of that uh, in November. So they'll go through an assessment. And last but not least, for talent management, we have the assignment satisfaction key, the listed uh, uh, assignment module, so that you're going to be able to go in and say, here's all the assignments that I have for this year, and this is where I would like to go, and you can rank over those. The difference between Ask M and the officers is that you won't be able to get an acceptance from the unit. You're going to see the assignments that are open, you're going to be able to rank order where you prioritize, where you would like to go, and then the assignment manager is going to be able to try to get you that one through five on your request. And the only difference is the unit won't be able to accept you. We're working on that. Our goal is to get unit acceptance, and this is only going to be from staff sergeant to master sergeant on the ask end. And that's what we're doing for talent management. That's what we've done in the past year, and that's where we're going in the future. Next slide. Okay. Um, in conclusion, I just really want to say how proud I am to be your SAR major of the Army. We've had a really challenging year, and most of the time, I say not everybody gets to be in the SAR major of the Army during a global pandemic. Um, it's an opportunity, and I couldn't be more proud of how our soldiers uh, did in the last year. I couldn't be more proud to be your SAR major of the Army. And now, without further ado, I'll turn it over. Thank you, SMA Grinson. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your initiatives. Um, we appreciate your leadership, and I, for one, SMA, am a big fan of the things you're doing to take care of our soldiers and their families. And we appreciate having both you, the chief, and well, all three of you, the end secretary behind the helm of the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on now to some. Thing that uh, a lot of soldiers have been waiting for, and that is the announcement of the Best Warrior. The Best Warrior competition dates back to 2002 when Chief of Staff of the Army General Eric Nationstein and SMA Jack Tilly made the decision to culminate all the NCO and Soldier of the Year comp competitions across the Army, back to the Army level. In 2009, as part of the year of the Army Commission Officer, Chief of Staff of the Army George W. Dick Jr. and the SMA decided to name the trophy presented to the NCO and Soldier of the Year as a way to honor the legacy of the Sergeant of the Army Jack Tilly and what this competition does for our Army to enhance self-development and self-study and to set training standards for our force. As a prelude to the announcement of this year's winners, please watch this short video of the 2020 Best Warrior Competition. <laughs> If you want it, we can get it. Like it's hard, but don't you let it get you down. Go get the crown because I'm talking that way. Thank you, can say, Well, we need the game. My name will remain. We don't need the things. You can keep this shame. We broke free, so things won't be the same. Nah, on the mission, gotta get it. Let's work. We were raised on the net. I raised my net work. But it ain't about the money. Nah, it ain't about the cause. All that matters is the one who we are. No, that's not it now. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce this year's Best Warrior Soldier Competitor, representing United States Army Reserve, Specialist Stanley T. Thompson, representing Training and Doctor Command, Specialist Keith E. Howe, representing Army Material Command, Specialist Francisco A. Gutierrez, representing the Military District of Washington, Specialist Jonathan McBride, representing United States Army Forces Command, Specialist Garrett W. Turner. Representing Army Special Operations Command, Specialist Calvin Fonte. Representing United States Army Europe, Specialist Justin M. Rivard. Representing Army Cyber Command, Specialist Genesis Miranda. Representing United States Army Pacific, Specialist Wei Yo. Representing Army Futures Command, Sergeant James B. Akinola. Representing Army National Guard, Corporal Daniel R. DiPolito. And now, the announcement and the answer to the question you've all been waiting for. Who is the Soldier of the Year for America's Army for 2020? Well, the good news, uh, I didn't actually have to read all those names out, so I really appreciate that. So, and the winner is Sergeant James Akinola on the Army Futures Command. So I know he would like to be here in person, and, you know, since I was never, you know, the Soldier of the Year for the Army. I, I finally get to accept this board on your behalf. Congratulations to him and the all the Army Future Command. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity, and uh, we're going to make sure that you get the trophy uh, sent to you. And you know, just so you know, you know, they can see the future, so maybe that's why he had a leg up. Uh, but uh, it's really good uh, that we got an opportunity to do this. Congratulations to him and the whole Army Futures Command team. Congratulations, Sergeant Akinola. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce this year's best warrior NCO competitors. Representing the United States Army Reserve, Staff Sergeant Benjamin L. Latham. Representing Army Futures Command, Staff Sergeant Mayra Rodriguez. Army Special Operations Command, Sergeant First Class Alexander Berger. Representing the Military District of Washington, Sergeant Ethan M. Wooler. Representing United States Army Europe, Staff Sergeant William E. McLean. Representing Army Cyber Command, Sergeant James A. Hustler Jr. Huster Jr., I'm sorry. Representing United States Army Forces Command, Staff Sergeant Marcus J. Padillo. Representing United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Staff Sergeant Wayne R. Hartman. Representing United States Army Pacific, Sergeant First Class Daniel S. Toomey. Representing Army Material Command, Staff Sergeant Jason A. Simmons. Representing the Army National Guard, Staff Sergeant Mitchell Schofield. So SMA, who is the non-commissioned officer for America's Army for the year of 2020? So I'd like to congratulate Sergeant First Class Alexander Berger, United States Army Special Operations Command. So not only do I get to represent uh, you know, the soldiers now, the NCO Corps, and uh, congratulations to Yusuf Scott and, uh, and Star First Class Burger. Outstanding job. Congratulations to our non commissioned officer and soldier of the year. Um, as a reminder, I would ask you to look to the right side of your screen. Right now, we're going to transition to asking the phone ranger questions. If you have a question, please post it, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Also, as a reminder, if there are questions that the Star Man of the Army can't get to today, we will make sure that the Star Man of the Army's office receives each and every question that you send in. Thank you for your participation. Back to you, Star Man. Okay. SMA, our first question out of Fort Riley from Facebook Is the Army going to look into an increase in suicide rates? Uh, yes, we've already started looking into the increase in suicide rates. Um, we, we really looked at this, and we actually had one of the doctors say, you know, have we had a direct correlation between 
uh, COVID and our suicide. Um, and they said, well, there is no direct link between, you know, uh, what we're doing, uh, COVID isolation, or how we've kind of distanced ourselves from us and our soldiers in March, but we actually saw a spike in March. So what we did is we started a, a life worth living discussion that's led by myself and the, the vice chief of staff of the Army. And we've met every month uh, for the last few months to see our, what, what else can we do um, to stop you know, the rise in our suicide rate. And I still think, I, I fundamentally believe it goes back to you know, what I was talking about. This is my squad. Do I actually know uh, the people that are around me? Do I know their families? Because with suicide, what we're seeing is the family knows, and then we've had a couple of times where they didn't know who to call. So the family says, hey, there's something going on. There's something going on. Let me call this location or that location. But now, you know, that's what it's important about knowing the people in your squad, by having that ownership, is call the family. Call the family before something bad happens and say, hi, I'm your supervisor of, you know, Dan. I always wanted to be Dan supervisor, by the way. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Dan's supervisor. I think he's a great person. He's a great, you know, NCO, and here's my number. If you hear anything, just give me a call. And if you ever need anything, let me know. So really worried, concerned about how this, you know, the suicide rates are going. We're having a life worth living a discussion. Uh, but I'd ask us all as NCOs and leaders, officers, one officers, DAs, civilians, everybody, to get to know your people. And then don't be afraid to reach out to the family. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to the friend. Call friends. Just say, hey, you know, I'm their supervisor. I'm really proud to have them on my team. That's one thing I think it's really important to help with our suicide. Um, but we're, we're definitely concerned about it. But we all need to do better with just talking to our people so that we can know them. So if something were to happen, the family knows who to call. And we can also intervene faster. Um, that's why, to me, it all boils down to having a cohesive team, and this is my squad. If I have that cohesive team, I trust that the leader is there for me, good times and bad, so when I'm having some trouble, I can go to them. And if you can't um, go to them, there's a lot of resources that we're looking at. Um, you know, you got the chaplain. We got behavioral health specialists. We're looking at how we can, you know, get some virtual behavioral health. So they're available even for access and really getting continuity of care. We also found through our life worth living discussions is that sometimes I was having these issues and then I moved to another location and um, the behavioral health you know, kind of doesn't go along with me. Why can't we do something? So we're looking at virtual uh, behavioral health so that we don't lose um, that, that continuity through a transition. And that's when we're having a lot of issues. Know, and everybody has issues, especially when you transition. You know, where am I going to live? Where are my kids going to go to school? Oh, do I have enough money for this area? And then all those burdens of some of the financials and this, the transition. Um, so how do we have some continuity through that? So that's that's how we're looking at it to do better with um, our transitions. That's some of the things we're doing uh, for life worth living. Uh, but we, I'd ask us all. Um, to really engage with those people around us. Um, and it's not just about the squad leader. This is all of us knowing the people that are sitting right next to us. And I think that's what's going to help us out uh, with the suicide. We can do this. We are going to make 2021 better this year uh, with suicides. But I'm going to need everybody's help with this by engaging leadership, engaging friends, engaging families. So if we do have our folks going down that road, uh, we, can, we can pick them back up. And seeing behavioral health is not a bad thing. It's okay. We all have to go there. It feels like, you know, every, every time I go there, it's not this, you know, behavioral health is the stigma. It should be. It's okay if you don't ask for help. And then for those of your 
you know, it's okay to talk to your soldiers about these things, these difficult topics, but you got to know your soldiers. I think when you don't know your soldiers, if we can do that better, we're going to see those suicide rates go down. All right, uh, SMA, the next question is also from Facebook. How will the Army continue to provide ready soldiers and not, quote, soft soldiers if there is no longer a shark attack? <laughs> so uh, uh, I so to define what the shark attack is versus uh, the first 100 yards. So what we had, uh, the definition of a shark attack is what I actually had, probably what all you had, some of you had, uh, for the older folks is when you came off that cattle car, you know, you had, you know, 1,000 drill sergeants yelling at you. And I still give my example. One of my drill sergeant buddies, a great guy. He's, he's retired now, so I won't give his name out. He's sitting there and he's like, hey, we're drill sergeants together. And he's yelling at this guy and said, range walk, range walk, range walk. And I eventually pulled him aside today. Uh, probably doesn't know what you're talking about. It's like, we haven't told him what range walk is. So, I think that's where we're going. I don't think we're building soft soldiers. It's going to, like, instead of screaming at them, they go, I don't know what you're talking about. We're going we're gonna to bring them in and show them what it means to be on a, a disciplined, fit, cohesive team. And that first 100 yards, and that's what we're doing at Benning. And uh, I'm excited to go down next week and do some of that. So I don't think we're building soft soldiers. It's just a better way to do it. And then you don't actually confuse anybody by sitting there yelling at them. It's something that they actually don't know. All right, SMA, one more question from Facebook before we shift over to the AUSA platform. Uh, Chris Burks asks, why is the ACFP being pushed back until 2022 and no PT test to validate as a uh, record PT test during this time? Uh, this has given us enough time to actually take the ACFT. Um, when we looked at it about a year and a half ago, or two years or three years before, uh, I don't think we actually saw a global pandemic coming. <laughs> so as we got the equipment out, we can get equipment out, but how do we bring people together? And how do we maintain those fitness levels uh, over time? Our gyms closed. Our, uh, we didn't have all the equipment out. We had to, we had to figure out how we're gonna do this and we start to see. So we pushed this out. And this is about, again, a gauge leader. You can still maintain a good fitness level if you have a good soldier and a good plan. I said that, you know, the pavement is still open. Um, there are many body weight things uh, that you can do to maintain your fitness. But the reason we went to March 22 is to give everybody the opportunity to go ahead. We're going to take right now. There's no more APFT. It's the test of record. I'm taking mine on Thursday. Normally, I would take it with the uh, the uh, best warrior competition that's going to be last year, uh, but it cleared this year with virtual. So uh, they took one, but nobody took it here, right here. So I'm going to take it on Thursday. And that's what everybody should be doing. Um, and it still requires us to take the test, and it's going to help us inform the decision. But the reason we pushed that back was a couple of things to give everybody a chance to get the equipment out and give us plenty of time. To actually go ahead and take all those tests that we have. We don't want to disadvantage any group, and then we go for March 20th. But it doesn't negate the fact that you still need to get good, hard physical fitness. SMA, the next question is from the USA chat. Are you looking at developing a system similar to the Battalion Command Commander Assessment Program for the selection of Command Sergeant Major? Uh, yes, that's why we're running a, that prototype in November, we've got 32 SAR majors that are going to actually, they're actually going to go through the battalion commander's assessment program. They're going to go through the whole assessment, they're going to go to the board. Uh, it's going to be a different board. It's not going to be all officers. It's going to be SAR majors on that board to have a cognitive and non cognitive assessment for the SAR majors. And that's going to inform us. It's going to inform us where we need to do it, the resources that we need, that we need to tailor it. Um, so we're going to do that in uh, November. Then we're going to see at where did those 32 fall out on the OML, the CSM, and then we're looking to maybe do another prototype or pilot in the, in the spring of next year to see if we get that right. We can produce this out. Yes, we're doing it. Now, is it going to be exactly what the officers do? No. 
because we're different. So we're trying to get our program up. And so that's why I talked about that uh, when I briefed it. And it we are going to do a, a prototype of that in November to inform us. But it's coming. So it's coming uh, faster than you think. We're trying to keep momentum. Uh, but uh, we're just not there yet to make sure the, the right program. So my next one is uh, on Facebook, and it's, it's more a comment. So for the for motor transport operators in senior leader course class, 21-001, get a shout out from the FMA. Our whole class is watching and discussing the speech. I think you just got a shout out right there. I think that was it. Uh, good for you. Uh, everybody should be on this thing. So um, the whole goal is to have all our PME students and initiatives. Because this is like like I was talking about NCO strategy. This is our strategy. This, you should hear about that from the Army uh, as we go through a is a good way to do it, uh, but everybody should be tuned in and know about this. Is it something that I talked about in the initiative, uh, initiative three? You should have, start asking those questions. Hey, how can I do this in my squad? What does that mean to me at my level? What does this mean? That was our major. Here's an NCO authority. It's like that point. Did you have you read that yet? Well, maybe I haven't. I don't have that change. You need to go back to that. So, uh, shoot out. Thanks for the SLC listening in, uh, and hopefully we have most of our PMPs across the globe listening in. That's the next one is from the USA platform. Uh, what PME backlog do you foresee from COVID-19 challenges for staff sergeant to sergeant for class? Well, <laughs> well, we signed an ETP uh, because we just could figure out how to get virtual means for ALC uh, for staff sergeants. So we did create a pretty big backlog. Um, but what I'm trying to do is it's we're also trying to look at how do we do constructive credit. And constructive credit has been in the manual for a long time. But um, we have some MLS that don't actually have an ALC. And those are the ones that actually normally get through a constructive credit. I think it's uh, some of the recruiters don't have advanced leaders before. So they get, they're pretty familiar with constructive credit. We're trying to see how we can do constructive credit, but we do, we did create a backlog just from June, July, and August. We did an ETP for ALC for those to get promoted to staff sergeant. If we just went back to normal operations and we didn't let any sergeants to go through, it would take us almost uh, 2022 calendar year to get after the backlog we just created. So looking to expand our classes, we've shortened uh, some of the ALC just a little bit so that we maybe can get another class in there to the year to get after some of the backlog. So uh, we're looking to do constructive credit, we're looking to shorten some of our ALC classes, but we did create a big backlog. So the two are shorten the classes, increase capacity, um, do constructive credit. And the third thing is I did actually change a little bit of the priority. So in February, we're going to go back to Sergeant Promotable as the number one priority for ALC. So those staff that were already promoted uh, will actually be the second priority so we can get back to select, train, educate, and promote. That's me, the next one again from the AUSA platform, the Fire Center of Excellence. Uh, Non-commissioned officer academy at Fort Sill asked, "What are the steps to be taken to assist units uh, with current leadership challenges going on in the Army, uh, like Fort Hood? What resources are available to junior leaders?" I would say there's a lot. Of, I think it's like so many resources available that we actually, you know, it's almost too much. So we're actually trying to. That's why getting a, a squad leader app will actually help us narrow down where the resources are so that's number one number two the biggest one again the app doesn't you know make up for that is i again i want to say you know build a better leader itself. and some people don't actually understand when i say that what i, what I truly mean by it, i have you know, i want to do more of this whether that's sexual assault do more sexual assault classes do more uh equal opportunity classes I think we already have some of those classes available, but 
do I need to redo the professional military education to build a better leader? And then if I have a better leader, uh, then hopefully I don't need to do more of these classes over here and over there. Uh, but that's number one. But what are, what are we really looking at? I think the most important thing that the secretary uh, and the chief are talking about is giving us time. And I could say time is the most valuable thing. So Forces Command, and we're looking to implement this uh, Army-wide that said, we're going to do one day. It started out at JBLM, Chase Lewis McCord. They said, we're going to give you one day a month to do all your readiness, all your readiness day. They said it's going to be where you get a chance and you actually take the time to get to know your soldier. And I think that's how we get after uh, some of those things you've seen that have plagued Fort Hood, and some of those things that have plagued basically as an army. But we need the time, and then once we have the time, we, we use it wisely. We get to know our soldiers, we do our counseling, we make sure we're up to date on our physical fitness test, we make sure uh, that we walk through the barracks. Maybe we put on our uniform to make sure, you know, we've got the, you know, my army service uniform seems to be, the army green service uniform, fits right, and it's all going well. So okay, given the, giving the unit time, one day a month, full day to go back and relearn some of those things we've done. I think that's the most important thing that we're going to do. That's me. The next question will, this is my squad in any way be integrated uh, with the system already available, such as IPSA and EMS? Yes. I'm not, we still haven't fully implemented IPSA yet, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Compo 2 and 3 already have it. Um, so we're still working on the couple one. I'm not sure how this is my going to be integrated, but the, this, the digital training management system, or, or whatever we call it in the future, is going to be integrated into this is my squad app. So the number one priority I asked for them to work on in the app, number one, was sponsorship. It goes back to what I was talking about before. How do you transition? So if I've got an app that helps me, you know, just say, hey, I've got, Ortega's come to my unit. He's got a family. He needs a house. He's kids. He's got kids, so they need to go to school. So if I can get sponsorship and welcome you into my unit, that was the number one priority for this is my squad. The, this is my squad app. The second thing was training management. It's also, you know, one of our last efforts in the NCO strategy. So the digital training management would download into the my squad app. And we what the goal is to be able to sit out there, I do my PT test, I do a task for my warrior task in Melrose, I can do that, put that in the app, and it gets uploaded in the digital training management system. And that's the, the goal of the this is my squad app. So yes. All right, the next question is from Facebook SMA. In regards to the enlisted talent management, is there a component of the plan to address and guide the enlisted leaders of the Army Reserve and the National Guard? Stay on par with the active component. Uh, well, yes, but it's 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 clearly much more difficult to do. Um, you know, how do I, you know, if I've got you know, one battalion maybe over four or five different states, and how do I bring them in and do an assessment? And where's the location? It's kind of similar to the problem we're having uh, with the first song. So we want to do a first start program, but all the first sergeants don't go to one central location, where the Sergeant Majors Academy, everybody goes pretty much through the Sergeant Majors Academy. So, um, I think for Compo 2 and 3, to do talent management, you're going to have the same talent that we're going to find through uh, the first sergeant's um, talent assessment. That we're run. And how do you do it? Where's the location? How many resources do you need? And Sergeant Major Stanford and Sergeant Major Lombardo those organizations, and they're, I think what they're going to do be able to do is learn for the active component. As we kind of go through this, you know, they've already asked to be integrated into it. I'll kind of hand that off, and they can see how they're going to work for uh, a battalion that's in three or four states. And how do they do that? Our talent assessment. That's me. The next one's from the state platform. Uh, Ronnie McLean asks, Will the new PME find 
financial literacy training teach young leaders how to plan and use government savings programs to send children to college? <laughs> send children to college. Um, well, I, I'm not sure it'll be that you know specific on how to send uh, children to college financial literacy. Uh, I think I've looked at some of the PFIs already, so it just increases some of the awareness of those options that are available the thrift savings program. And what do I need? Do I need to have more life insurance? Do I need to have an emergency fund? And it may not say, so it's how do you uh, get uh, financial stability and literacy on things you can do, and it may not be that tailored to you as an individual. But we do have, in the Army uh, Community Services, we do have programs where you can sit down and say, here's some of the things I need to do. We, we pay folks on our installations already to help you with these things. You can get some advice and say, here's one of the goals I need. And you sit down with one of those. I think that, that would be more tailored to you know, how to get my kids pay for college as opposed to, you know, how do I save money and wealth over time? And that's the, and, or how do I not put myself in, in bad debt over time? And how do I save for retirement? It's in a, a more general speaking as opposed to um, saving for college. But you can always use, you know, if you got the 911 GI Bill, you can still use the 911 GI Bill uh, for your college education. Um, you have a service for annual requirement, I believe, is six years. So uh, if, you stay in, if you're in the active component, transfer that uh, uh, that benefit to your family members. SMA, the next question is from Facebook. Would the Army be looking into altering the height and weight standard due to the implementation of the ACFT? For example, females are expected to perform the same as males, but what uh, is so right now, usually I say no. So, uh, so, uh, and if we weren't doing this completely, I'd say, well, what do you want the body fat percentage to be? So I know it's about weight, but it's also about body fat percentage. Um, we are not the service. Um, the Marines have a, a lower body fat percentage than we do as an Army. Um, I think for females is 36% body fat. And males, about 28% body fat. So if you, if you really paid attention on my slides, one of those things I wanted to do was make us more fit. And um, actually the goal is reduce our body fat uh, as an army. So at some point in time, when you get so much uh, body fat, you're gonna be, you know, literally the army, it would be obese. It's about the body fat. The goal is not to make that larger uh, for anyone. Um, the one thing we are looking at, and one of the studies that we have is, uh, and it is for female athletes, we're looking at those females that have gone through Ranger School and Special Forces, if they kind of change their body composition, do we need another you know, special measurement? Do we need to do something additional? Tradoc has the lead. So right now, we're not looking to increase, because you didn't say specifically increase our, our body fat percentage. Uh, that is not the goal. The goal is to make sure we're more fit. Um, and it's not, it's not about body fat. It's about lean uh, muscle. Um, yeah, muscle may weight, but it also, when you do the body fat percentage, uh, you still pass the tape. Um, and not increase how much body fat is in the uh, body. Estimate the next one is from AUSA. With the removal of gender and race and photos from DA boards, is there a panel to, or is there, excuse me, a plan to redact all the names and gender pronouns? Um, we've talked about that. We've, we've, um, we've heard this several times. We need to um, really redact names. So we're looking at it. Um, right now, we're trying to, to really look at the way we're thinking. We don't want to, you know, I think we go to, we, we look at a photo and go, oh, that looks like the record. record. Uh, we're trying to do away with that. If I'm looking for a name, you know, am I looking for a gender 
And I say, I just really want to do that. I think those, those folks, they don't deserve to be in our army. If you're really looking at deliberately at a name and being, I mean, that's, that's somebody I think that is racist and, you know, that really probably doesn't need to be in our army. We are looking at taking away the names and personal pronouns, but again, that's going to take a lot of time. Um, you know, you got five years of NCOER, and if you start, you know, redacting the names and the personal pronouns, some of it just won't even make sense. So, uh, looking at it, but we, what we really need to do is say, is that, so what we did with the photo, we did a two year study. Uh, it may feel like we made this decision um, all of a sudden in June. There was a two year study that showed that the photo influence how people voted on the record. So before we say, hey, let's go to you know, removing names and genders and how we write, um, I would like us to see did that make a difference on how people voted. Um, because that's actually what we got to study. The two-year study showed that the photo had an influence on how people voted on the record. Um, and, I, and it wasn't about the names and how it was written. It was just the, the image had an influence. So I'd like to see a study on that because it, it will take us some time to redact all the you know his or her personal pronoun how to write that we're looking at it but we're not there yet SMA the next question is from Michael Kelly he asks using highly trained discipline and physically fit metrics are there any new initiatives to help reduce the high non-deployable numbers the Army has traditionally had uh, Yes, it's called the Army Combat Fitness Test. It's like the whole goal of that was to reduce muscular skeletal injury. You know, you know, make those lower extremities a little stronger by doing that next step. But being able to do a sprint track theory reduces some of those injuries. Uh, but the good news is, I know uh, most people don't realize we've actually around four, five, six, below six percent non deployables. That is a uh, Extremely low from where we were about 10 years ago. Um, we were you know, 10, 11, 12 percent. I mean, it was, you know, 50, 60, you know, 70, 80,000 people were non available and non deployable. So 5.6 percent is a pretty good number. So the goal of those two things that I talked about, and it's just number one with the Army Combat Fitness Test, making us all stronger uh, for the actions that we're doing. So what's happening is we have this, this task to, to do, but what we didn't do is bring our bodies to do that task. So we were hurting ourselves. So yes, Army Combat Fitness Test. The second, actually, the diet. Uh, so I know it might be surprising is musculoskeletal injuries uh, sometimes. And if you look at, if I have way more you know, over time, you know, heart problems on the joint, weight on the joint gives me more non deployment uh, So we really want to reduce. Uh, we want to make us more fit, but we also want to reduce the weight. Um, and those are some of the things we're doing on non-available, non deployment SMA, the next question is from Command Sergeant Major Kalinsky. He says, what are a few things that you can impose on future N or NCOs in the field that made you successful as a staff sergeant, sergeant first class uh, that you don't see going as well these days? Well, Sergeant Major Glenn, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you're in the room, I'd say thanks to you <laughs> again. Uh, thanks for asking that question. Um, so I would say I, I'm going to tailor it to a question I do actually get asked. A lot of people say, well, um, you know, how do you become the sergeant of the Army? And my answer is, whatever you do, don't worry about the Army. So I, even as a sergeant, staff sergeant, um, you know, sometimes we're worried about what other people think about, you know, instead of doing what's right for your unit in the Army right then. Don't worry about, well, you know, is this going to hurt me? No, is that, you know, I don't know how doing the right thing the right way would ever hurt you, by the way. But sometimes I get this sense that we're afraid to, to make that correction. We're, we're afraid to insult the 
discipline in our organization. We're afraid to say, hey, stop that, whatever that is. Um, so engage leadership uh, is one of the things that I think we, we all have to, to get back to. And don't worry about you know, you know, what other people are going to think. And that's what I mean by don't, don't worry about it. Don't try to get to that next level. Be the best version of you right now and do what you think is right for the Army and your organization. And sometimes I think as, uh, as I go around, the NCOs are trying to, you know, you know, well, I don't know. Do I write this counseling? Do I take this action? Do I do this or do I do that? I'm trying to get, I think I'd ask you not to do, to go in. You did it for all the right reasons. You did it the right thing. The right way. I think we're going to be better. Uh, I see that they're not engaging uh, sometimes that way. Some organizations do it better than others. But I would say don't be afraid to engage with your soldiers uh, and be the leader that you wanted when you were that, uh, that young soldier. That's maybe the next question. Facebook. Does the Army plan to impose stricter restrictions on soldier use of social media? Uh, no. I think I think even if we did try, it would be just some other social media thing that just comes up. Um, stricter restriction on. You know what? What asked you to do, though? Just to remind you, because it came up in one of our panels. You know, SMA Daily and I. Was, one of the staff starts says, "Hey, now you can do anything you want on social media." Um, I would tell you that's not true. You can't do whatever you want on social media. Uh, so, kind of the uh, tighter. I don't think we're going to have tighter restrictions on what you can do. I'm just saying the world open up. But I would caution you all that you know things that happen on social media can come back uh, to haunt you. And this is no different than what uh, people do. They look at your social media page. Uh, they look at all these kind of things that you do on social media. Um, so I, I, I would say we're not going to have kind of restrictions on it. But I caution you all, uh, these things are out there. Um, it's public knowledge. We have put a, a page on it. We put out an expert on how to do social media and some of the things. So I wouldn't say you can't do anything you want um, on social media. Yes, maybe we've got one more question. Uh, this is from Angelo Curry on Facebook. Over the years, it seemed the push was to do more with less, and it was a lot of pushback from leadership and service members. Well, it was difficult and stressful. Many units have done more with less during COVID. Is the success of doing more with less during the crisis going to be the new normal for the Army after the crisis is over? Um, yeah, I, I guess I've heard this throughout many years of doing more or less. Um, but I, that's where the chief and the staff of the Army and the secretary are really appreciate. One of the things that we're talking about is giving us more time. It's, and that's actually when you, when you look at one of the things I talked about, training management, when you really lay out, I need to do this counseling and I need time to do warrior task and battle. I, yeah, I need time to do this. And you start from the, from the, from the ground and build the foundation up. Uh, you're going to see that we'll be able to do more or less. What we really want to do is an expert at the foundation and then build on top of that. So our goal is not on these things. Here's why I ask both of the leaders on things pile in is that um, I looked at the letter that we wrote um, maybe a couple of years ago they don't have a cor corruption NCO and uh, you know I laughed and said I didn't know I was supposed to have NCO. <laughs> and we go, yeah, I never have one. But so what I asked you to do is not um, you're not going to ask the leaders uh, in the next year or two more or less we're asking you to set your priorities and then stick to them and say, hey, today is the day I'm going to do this. And then that's what I plan. That's what I've resourced. 
And that's what I'm going to try and execute. And don't let anybody pull you off that plan. Um, and that's how you do uh, training management. And that's how you stick to not doing, you know, more with less. Is that you have a good training management plan. Here's your resources. And you stick to it. And it takes all of us. And I'll give, you know, my own self as an example is, you know, hey, I wanted to do my regular thing. And I think my statement was, well, if the White House calls and the chief tells me I'm going to do this, then I'll go do it. But other than that, I plan to go do my counseling in my office. I plan to do, like, some of the home visits. We're going to do phone calls. So that's training management. And that's how we, in my personal opinion, that's how we don't do more or less. That's how we stick to our training management. Thank you. Sergeant Major of the Army, thanks again. All of us at the Association of the United States Army want to thank you for giving us the valuable time and your insight and missions for the future. We greatly appreciate it. I also want to say congratulations to all the best warrior competitors. For Sergeant Nakanola, Sergeant First Vice Berger, you represent all that is good on our Army. And congratulations to you. The Association of the United States Army that sponsors will look for a fitting tribute to you in the future with the SMA we can recognize you officially in person and reward you for your accomplishments that you achieved in your careers. We want to thank you again for joining us today and sharing your vision and initiatives for the future of our Army. All of us here today to say we want to thank you for what you do for our soldiers, their families, and the American people. And finally, we want to thank all of you who joined us today and those of you that are AUSA members. Ladies and gentlemen, membership matters. And through your membership, you support soldiers the Army civilians and families, and you help us deliver programming like today's discussion. So please join AUSA or renew your membership at AUSA.org. Good evening.